nadam se da ste već navikli da na ovoj zimi uvek po savremenim tehnologijama pričamo baš sa vrhunskim stručnicima. I nekako smo uvek ispostavili da su među tim vrhunskim stručnicima naši ljudi. Tako i ovog puta sa jednog od najstarijih IT razvojnih centara i jednog od najuglednijih razvojnih centara, upravo iz IBM Research Center iz New Yorka, dolazi Maja Vuković. Maja će nam pričati o poslovima za koja ona iznače tamo zadružena, pošto vodi tim za AI modernizaciju alata. I inače ima preko 220 patenata, tako da stvarno ne znam ko bi bio pozvaniji od nje da nam priča ovaj sljedeći tim. Pozdravimo Maja. Nećete zapraviti što će mi se povrljeno osvrtiti na laptop i nešto će prezentacija biti na engleskom. Drago mi je da imam priliku da prezentujem i da sa vama podelim sve naj o tehnologijama, o latest technologies in AI. It's a great pleasure to be here and share with you the excitement about innovation in the region and what the latest happening around generative AI is often also referring to. So it goes without saying that over the past couple of years there has been a tremendous, uh, I would say, a revolution in AI. I think it goes beyond just having AI write school essays or pass the law exams, entrance exams to universities, but we have really witnessed a huge shift going from the era of understanding where we had machine learning or more broadly AI essentially doing the task of understanding, doing object recognition, uh, classifying facts to the era of generation, whether you're generating text, content of any kind, text, images, videos, or code, generating new code, understanding the new code. So how did we get there? Essentially, if you think about some of you in the audience might recall Lisa Chatbot or thinking maybe back to 60s or 80s in the last century, where it was the era of expert systems. That was the AI back then, hard-coded rules, that were capturing sort of the logic, the reasoning, but not very scalable, right? In the early 2000s, we entered the era of machine learning with the rise of big data, but the challenge was still there. You had to have teams who would be doing feature engineering, building capabilities, preparing data and processing it for each individual task, whether you wanted to do classification, prediction, and so on. Then came deep learning. It, it certainly accelerated the generative AI journey. However, for, from the enterprise perspective, there was still a limitation in terms of the tuning. We still needed that labeled data, the same labeled data that you needed to train the machine learning models. However, today we are in the era of foundation models, or as some people interchangeably call it, large language models. These language models are not just limited to being models that are based on natural language, but they come in different modalities image-based, video-based, time series, or essentially, or with the many late, recent announcements, they're multimodal, they combine different modalities. And what is so different and transformative about foundation models is that now you can train one large model in a self-supervised man manner without requiring labeled data. But more, more importantly, you, just, you do this once. And then if you want to add more knowledge or fine tuning for a specific task, you need relatively less amount of data. And you don't need to start from scratch. You can continuously evolve these models either through instruction tuning, fine tuning, and, and edit or essentially expand the spectrum of tasks that this model can uh, cater to. So to give you an analogy, right, with large language models, they are trained in the text. Now one same model can be used to understand the text, generate new content, translate this text from language to language, or convert it to another form. Um, it goes without saying that there is a huge excitement um, in the community, in the enterprises, about the potential of the generative AI technologies. There are certain new challenges, and also tackle those, mention those as well, but there is a significant opportunity, both in terms of the growth, as well as the labor productivity, and the automation that is anticipated, the levels of automation that are anticipated to, to be reached in less than a couple of decades. But we are not there yet. Today, only about 80% of enterprises are exploring 
generative AI and what it might mean in the context of their own operations. And according to the latest Gartner report, only 10% of the enterprises worldwide are actually deploying production level generative AI solutions. And why is that? There are a few reasons. A couple of them are related to skills, the requirements for upskilling. A lot of it is to do with data, especially in highly regulated industries, and where there are lots of complexities of data that needs to be processed and fed into the models to build actually trustworthy models which would tackle the challenges, the ethical challenges as well as the behavior of the model. Is the model behaving the way you anticipate? And how do we overcome this? So by developing algorithms that can do data preparation, processing, have filtering, removing any profanities, any undesirable behavior in the generative AI, as well as building the trustworthiness and the relationship with the end user of the system, ensuring them that the model and explaining them why is the model generating the content in a certain way, and ensuring that it does this in a reliable and safe manner. So talking about trustworthiness and transparency, just like we have witnessed a huge uptake of open source technologies when it comes to operating systems such as Linux or deployment environment running architectures like Kubernetes, I would say predominantly AI today is evolving in the open source. Over two thirds of the models that were released in the past year are available in the open source at the various levels uh, of how much is actually shared. Um, but they are in the open, and it's not just the models. There is a huge ecosystem uh, that is powering the development of new AI technologies. Some of you probably this sort of uh, resonates. There are lots of companies that are the startups who are releasing the new open models, but there are also lots of tools and runtimes that enable you to build new models or to build the solutions that are essentially wrapped around the latest AI technologies, whether it's uh, data preparation kits or evaluation benchmarks, and so on. So, at IBM Research, sort of where, where, where I spend a lot of my time building things, we have we are building. Um, we recently released a family of models called Granite, uh, and the one particular domain that I wanted to touch upon today is about code. I think there's a lot of coverage about natural language models, but what code represents is something very tangible and practical, how we can transform how we are building uh, software. So we have released, and this is also open source, you can go and download it from Hugin Pace or, um, or any sort of site online. And these models are constantly evolving. I think you are all witnessing that every day there is a new model release with more billions of parameters, larger context, window size, and so on. Uh, but this mo the particular granite code models are state of the art. You can see here results uh, against the human evaluation uh, benchmark. But kind of going back to the introduction about foundation model, what is unique here is that with this one code model, we can cater to enable solutions that understand the code bases in over 115 languages, that can generate new code, that can generate unit tests. There is significant uh, productivity opportunity here when you think about how much time developers spend building unit tests, testing the code, and also how much coverage you can, you can, you can sort of achieve using the traditional capabilities versus the ones that integrate with large language models. What are some of the enterprise use cases of the large language models? So a few of them are li listed on this chart, but I'll start with the one that's closest to my heart, the modernization, right? In most of the companies, large or small development companies, you have technical debt, you have evolving infrastructure, you might need to upgrade your Java version, you might want to re-platform your systems, move from one version to another. In, if you think about credit card processing systems, they, um, Thank you. Uh, they are still, while they might have a very fancy front end mobile applications, many of them are still uh, relying on the transaction processing that's powered by mainframe. And these back end systems are lacking often documentation, and developers might have moved on. So, this is an opportunity for generative AI to, first of all, help us even understand this old legacy code. You might also want to translate it, take Java, take Cobalt to Java, or maybe you don't want to translate it. You want maybe just to refactor and tease out components that are better manageable and maintainable and reusable. 
testing the code, right? So those are some of the examples of the modernization. An area adjacent to modernization is all around IT operations. You have filter application, it's running great, whether it's a legacy app or a new app, but you want to prevent outages, right? You want to be able to predict what is going to happen next. Or in case of an outage, you want to be able to correlate the application runtime error to the code base itself. This is another use case where generative AI can help you. Last, last but not least, I'll touch upon digital labor. This is something that we are internally using a lot. The productivity effort that caters to the employees, whether it's asking sort of HR questions in the automated way, generating recruitment posts, um, enabling employees to access uh, business applications, business regulations and policies to enable their tasks to be performed faster. Those are some of the examples of the digital um, labor that is powered by large language models. So given all this large language model excitement, we are actually already at the, at the next big leap, and that is agents, right? So you can imagine large language models are not just generating content or generating code, but they can be used in pairs. So you can have large language models judging each other's output, evaluating it, they can work together, whether these are based on small or large models, but essentially they're becoming more complex solutions that are trying to understand the intent of the user, what does the user want to achieve, to break down the complex problem into several tasks, to act on it, possibly by augmenting the large language model with some function calling or tooling, just like we humans, we use the tools all the time to fulfill a certain goal. But then there is this observation loop and the ability to continuously learn. So to make it more specific, kind of to unpeel that onion or layered cake, this is the typical, I would say, um, design of the agent-driven system. And these are, these are just on the rise. Some of you who might be following uh, software engineering, uh, agent benchmark that came out of Princeton, and then there was open data, uh, open source, a, a similar project. Uh, these are systems that are very fastly evolving, tackling on very complex tasks. And when you un sort of peel this agentic system, they comprise of the LLM as a knowledge base, coupled with tooling. I think we're all using or building assistance, but these assistants today are typically with the predetermined stats, nothing wrong with that, statically determined workflows. But the power of agents is that they can now dynamically assemble the workflows, self-correct, if something in the environment changed and continuously learn. So going back to my favorite latest example around software engineering agent, imagine just pointing your GitHub repo and the git set of GitHub issues and an agent automatically grows and starts fixing the fixing these issues. Hopefully not by creating any new ones, but also running the unit tests and ensuring that the code behaves the way it's anticipating. And if you monitor the speed benchmark, this coverage and the accuracy is continuously and rapidly increasing over time. So with that, I think we are definitely way deep in the AI era. Agents are the next big thing. I think there's a lot of research happening also about the granularity of agents, trustworthiness of agents, putting the right guard, like guard layers. But to make it all work in the enterprise, we still need to overcome the data and skills challenges. Uh, to achieve the, the huge promise of the generative AI. Thank you very much and enjoy the class.